Morning, Sungate. How are you? Everybody well? All right. I like your energy. Nine o'clock was a little sleepy, so I need you, okay? Um, hey, just to let you know, kind of public service announcement, we may have some extra joyful noise in here this morning as we've just had kind of a, I don't want to say an issue, but we just, a lot of people called in sick this morning in our ch children's area, and so we may have a few extra in here today, and, uh, and so um, just wanted to let you know that uh, so that you're not rolling your eyes throughout service going, who let the kids in here? All right, so... Hey, let me encourage you. Um, some of these songs may be new to you. Uh, yeah, go ahead and stand up. Go ahead and stand up. Um, some of these songs may be new to you. And if you don't know how uh, to sing or singing come, is, is kind of weird to you, um, let me encourage you in something. I, as I read Ephesians 5 and as I read Colossians 3, I'm reminded that um, as we sing together, as we address uh, our Lord together, um, someone in front of you or someone behind you or beside you needs to hear the truth that we're singing in these songs. And so for you to remain silent, um, maybe because you're frustrated with a style or you just don't know and you kind of check out or I just don't sing, maybe that's your excuse. Someone around you needs to hear the truth of God. And even if it's just, God, I love you, or even if you just say the words, someone around you this morning needs to be encouraged and be reminded, maybe someone that's um, in, in the midst of something this morning, they need to hear that God is faithful. They need to hear that he's unchanging. Maybe you need to hear that this morning and you need your neighbor to sing that out loud. I'm not making that plug so you all sing along and I feel better about my job. I say that because we're in this thing together. You showed up here on a Sunday morning with all your junk and you're, you're, you're needing something, and you're wanting something. And the Holy Spirit just may use you or the person next to you as you sing so that you're encouraged by the singing of these trees together. All right? Is it a deal? All right. Let's sing together this morning. I've been teaching this song to you for the last few weeks.
of that great love that we have hope one of my favorite words if you will if there's a favorite word you can have in scripture is hope but I hate what we've done with the word we we flip we flip pennies in a, in a well we hope things work out for us we hurt we hope things come our way in 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 hope is surrounded by trials in times of pain and broken hearts, hope. Romans 5 tells us that that as trials come our way, that God is producing in us character. And Romans 5 says hope, but hope does not disappoint. You see, our hope is not in something that we just hope works out. Hope is based on something that happened already. It happened at Calvary. It's already done. And we have hope in that. That no matter what our circumstances are today, it already was taken care of. He wins. And we have put our faith and trust in that hope. Our hope is sure. It is secure. I don't know what brought you in here today. I don't know if you said, I'm just going to give church a try. This is, my, this is my last effort. I'm going to throw this penny in that well of church and see what works out. I'm here to tell you church will not work out. Jesus Christ does not disappoint. Maybe some of you in here have walked with Christ all your life. And you need to be reminded today in your circumstances, in your heartache, that hope does not disappoint. Hope does not put you to shame. Romans 12 says, rejoice in hope. And that's what we do today. Rejoice in hope.
giving his heart to the broken, sharing his home with the orphan. He is a joy, he is my joy, he is the hope of the nations. The Father is heart we're embracing, he is the song we're declaring.
already been accomplished. It is done. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, thanks for singing. It sounded awesome today. You may have a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? All right. My name is Dustin. I'm part of the student ministry here. I just want to tell you about a couple of things around our campus and different ways that you can get connected and plugged in here at Stonegate. First things first, uh, the Start Here card that should be in the seat back in front of you. This is an amazing way. If you've ever felt like Stonegate is a place where you can exist, but you don't really belong, or you've struggled to connect and take a next step, this is the purpose of this card. And really what we want you to do, whether you've been here for a long time and that description fits you, or you're brand new and that description fits you, we want you to fill it out front and back, drop it in the offering plate, or bring it to the information desk, because our hope is to help you take next steps here. We don't want this just to be a place you exist in on a Sunday. Um, and in light of the next steps, we do offer a classes called Next Steps, uh, aptly named. And the, the heart behind Next Steps is this. We don't want it just to be the, the thing that you take that gets you through membership or that makes you a part of this church um, contractually. We want this to be an opportunity to connect, to learn what we believe, and to begin to take next steps toward growth and influence and connection. And so those classes are coming up in May. You can sign up for them now online. Uh, beyond that, tonight, five to seven in the four year, we're going to honor Scott and Amy Hall uh, and their family and get to kind of send them off and say goodbye to them, kind of a come and go reception of sorts. So come and be a part of that. Uh, if you weren't here with us last week, we made an announcement that Scott and Amy are going to head to Fort Worth and pastor a church there. So tonight we get to honor them and saying goodbye, five to seven here in the four year. 
Uh, finally, it's that time where you're going to see a lot of shirts uh, that are going to be camp shirts, or they're going to say SGY or Stonegate Kids. You're going to see them in the foyer of people promoting camp. And, and this time of the year is a time when camp really begins to amp up, and we really start talking about it a lot, uh, to the point where you may zone us out when we talk about camp. But the heart behind camp is that it's the most impactful week that we have because we have a week, distraction-free with students, a chance to accelerate them into the summer and point them to something greater than they often get fed when they have a lot of idle time on their hands. And so we, we would love if you're, when you leave here today, whether you have people in your nest that need to go to camp or you have people in your circle of influence that need to go to camp, please talk to someone out in the foyer where the balloons and the people with shirts that say camp are standing. They'd love to talk to you, answer more questions, show you how to sign up. But we can sit here all day and tell you how impactful camp is. We decided instead we'd let a student tell you a little bit about camp, how camp has impacted their life. Check this out. I started going to camp after my seventh grade year. I was extremely nervous. I didn't want to leave my parents. I didn't want to leave my mom. My friends talked me into it because they had been to Siggy camp before and they loved it and they were like, come on. My mom signed me up and I went. The first day, it was rough because, you know, I didn't have my parents, I didn't have my phone to text my mom or my, my dad, but throughout the week, it just kept getting better and better. I did not have a relationship with the Lord before camp. I knew who God was, I knew who Jesus was, but I didn't ask him to be my Lord and Savior. I remember I was sitting in the middle, in the middle aisle and Bailey Dodds was singing Hosanna. And I just felt this weight of the Lord come upon me and I, I had to sit down. And I stopped bawling for no reason. And then just telling the Lord that, you know, I can't do um, this life by myself. I can't keep making the sins and same mistakes over and over again and just, I needed that forgiveness that Jesus offered on the cross. And that, that's how I came to know the Lord. As far as my time in Siggy, signing up for camp has been probably the best thing I've ever done. I look forward to it every year because I get away from the world, away from everything, and I just get to be with my friends who love Jesus and the Lord. I truly feel like in some moments at camp that it's just me and God. Trust the Lord that you will have an amazing time and he will show you um, who he is at camp more than that he ever has. Good job, Cade, and I hope you uh, take that uh, call for camp very seriously. Um, I'm, I'm always amazed at the sacrifices we'll make uh, to involve our children and grandchildren. And as uh, Dustin talks about people in our extended reach of influence, the, the hoops we will jump through to make sure a kid gets to band camp, sport camp, baseball camp, football camp, or any other camp, uh, considering that none of them will probably play sports professionally, but we still go through that. And then when a kid comes home and says, I don't want to go to camp, I don't like it, we accept that. Um, and they come home oftentimes to talk about hard times at a camp that's a band camp, football camp, baseball camp, cheerleading camp. And we say, well, you need to suck it up because maybe they're teaching you something you need to hear. It's always amazing to me the different extremes with which we approach that. And so uh, please give that some thought and speak into the lives of your kids and getting them ready for camp. So take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 1. I hope over the last couple of weeks you've received one of these charts. We have overrun our print run. So... Next week, we'll have some more in case you did not get a copy of one of these charts. If there's one nearby you, just scoot over next to them and say, hey, and uh, share their chart. That could be awkward. Don't do that. Um, but let's lay some biblical foundation here. We've been in this place for a couple of weeks, but we kind of move into the last part of the bad side of this chart in the struggle for transformation. And so next week, we'll change directions and talk about the direction we make in our needs and our circumstances that leads to life. As you find your way to James chapter 1, I also want to just say this from the beginning, because after the services, we, we have typically had many, many conversations of people who will come up to us who are, um, ad, I'll say, advanced in their years. They're not teenagers anymore. They think they are, but they're not. And they'll say something like this. I wish I'd heard this 25 years ago. And sometimes as you teach through this process, you begin to see the decisions you made in the past a little bit differently. So what I'm getting at is I hope you will sense, and if you don't sense it, at least hear me say it, 
that this is a guilt-free zone here this morning, and, and really every day. My intention is not to say something that would make you feel so guilty that you say, I'm a spiritual loser, I never could get this, I'm a failure, whatever that is. I know many of us in the church world have capitalized oftentimes on our ability to manipulate your sense of guilt in order to get you to make some form of decision that you're only going to feel guilty for again. And, and, and what happens is you just live a life filled with guilt, and you say, I'm not going back to church anymore because they just make me feel guilty. What we're going to talk about this morning is how what God really does is moves us into a place called godly sorrow. And I'll show you that again. And it's, it's the difference between, well, it's, it's the reality of when you have a deep, deep relationship with someone and the sorrow you feel that something has come between you. Some of you won't be able to get this analogy. You'll get it some other day. But many parents in the room who have older children know exactly what that feels like if they have a son or daughter that does the proverbial twist off or something related to that. The last thing you're going to do in your heart of hearts is want them to feel guilty because what hurts is there's a sorrow between the two of you because of decisions being made. And all you want is relationship. And for most of you in this room, what you need to hear is when you and I do not walk in the quote-unquote plan of God or direction of the Lord, God does not hover over us, so to speak, or sit on his throne like Arnold in Conan. We, he, he does not sit there and go, you're such a loser. Like, I don't even know why I love you. Because the Bible says Jesus took all that wrath on the cross. And then Jesus told us the story of the prodigal son. God longs to be in relationship with you, paid to be in relationship with you, rose from the grave to be in relationship with you. That doesn't mean we haven't done wrong. But Romans chapter 8 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So especially for those of you that maybe came to Christ at a young age and life took some twists and turns and decisions you would have never guessed or expected. The objective is not guilt. The objective is to get back to life. So please don't hear us saying, you room full of losers. And, and the reason why a lot of this is so, well, I, can, I don't even have to have notes to preach through this, is I've had to walk through a lot of this. And so I hope, you'll, I hope you hear the heart of what I'm trying to say. I need to move on. James chapter one, by the way, hello, Odessa. It's great to have you. We're so excited about what's happening and what's going on there in our north venue. It's good to have you over there as well. So James chapter one, let's begin reading in verse 12, just to lay the groundwork again. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. When he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Do not let any of you say when you are tempted, I am being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each and every one of us is tempted when we are lured and enticed by our own desires. Remember, we are needs-based creatures, security, identity, belonging. We've talked about all this in the past. And when I want to get my needs met is when I, I pursue things. And the reality is, just to make sure we understand this, we've said it many, many times, sin is attempting to meet my real needs outside of God's plan. Okay? Please understand that. St sin is not stealing cookies from the cookie jar. Sin is stealing cookies from the cookie jar because you don't believe your mom's going to feed you, so you meet your own need, okay? And so different things like, just understand that when I sin and when I rebel against the Lord, it is a manifestation of me trying to meet a need and not trust God to meet that need. I'm lured away by my own desires. And then it goes on to say this, then desire when it has conceived, when I actually get what I thought I wanted, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when all this takes place, is fully grown. It brings forth death. Remember, we said this last week. The worst thing for us is not necessarily physical death, but it's the death of our soul when we chase what we thought we wanted, needed, or thought we deserved, and we get what we thought we want, saw, or thought we deserved, and find out our soul still says that wasn't enough. Now, turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Laying some foundation here, then we'll go directly to the chart. So James chapter 3, find your way to verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who 
Who is wise and understanding among you? We'll be talking about wisdom more in the weeks ahead. It says, by his good conduct, his or her good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes from above. Now, that word bitter, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, you pretty much know what jealousy means. is this enviousness towards another. But selfish ambition is defined as the intentional politicking and manipulating of relationships. Okay? So I know that nobody in here has probably experienced that, but it's the intentional manipulation and politicking of relationships. Some of us have family histories where we know that there's always someone in the family who manipulates. There's someone in the workplace that manipulates. We manipulate. Oftentimes, very under the surface, we think you're manipulating relationships and manipulating conversations, especially when we're walking this path that we're going to finish talking about this morning. So let's keep reading. Verse 15 says, this is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So again, there's a wisdom from below and a wisdom from above. On this right-hand side of the chart, we're dealing with a decision of wisdom from below, which is defined as being demonic. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. It's never going to be right. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, and sincere. Now, turn over to the book of Hebrews. You're in James, you got to go left, okay? So if you're in James, you got to hang a left and go to Hebrews chapter 12. Don't grab a whole bunch of pages. It's very close. So go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And find your way to just one verse. It's verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Before I read this verse, for the sake of repetition, for the two millionth time, please remember grace is more than God's unmerited favor for salvation. Grace is God's abundant supply for the need of the moment. You're saved by grace. And then if you've ever heard this phrase, kept by grace, it means you're kept secure by unmerited favor, but you're also provided for by God's, God's unmerited favor and supply for the need of the moment. Every need you face, God intends to meet by grace and through grace. And he'll probably choose to meet that need through others. That'll come up here in just a minute. So Hebrews chapter 12, find your way to verse 15. We'll read one verse. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. He's speaking to the church, to believers. So that's why this idea of grace being God's supply is so important. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, watch this phrase, and by it many become defiled. Again, just a lot of scripture here, then we'll, we'll start working through the chart. Let me have you turn somewhere else. Go to 2 Corinthians. So you're in Hebrews. Let me guide you through this. Take a left. Um, if you're using a digital device, do what you do. Swipe, touch, whatever. If you're using a, a hard copy Bible, go to the left. Did I say go to the right? I said left? Okay, so go left till you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. This is a little bit of what I was talking about earlier this morning about this being a, a place that's a guilt-free zone, but there's sorrow when the relationship, I'll use this phrase, goes south a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, find your way to verse 10. Verse 10, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly grief or godly sorrow, depending on the translation you're carrying around, godly grief and godly sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly sorrow or worldly grief produces death. The reason I want you to hear that is because this is a, a letter written to the church, to followers of Jesus. Romans 8 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You, as a follower of Jesus, you can never be held guilty eternally under judgment. But we have issues and, and struggles that lead to sin still, and the relationship is broken, and therefore there's a sense that I need to turn around, change mind, and change direction. 
And that's this idea of repentance, okay? So, all right, here we go. Let's look at the chart. So, if you have a copy of it, go ahead and pull it out. If you don't, look at someone next to you or just uh, we'll get a copy to you next week. But as we work through the chart, I'll work you through to what's going to be on the screen. And they'll just bring it up on the screen here right now so you can get an idea. But we've told you for several weeks now that all of our circumstances we go through in life, and we all go through circumstances. Some people don't like that phrase, circumstances, and you know they treat it like a Zig Ziglar moment. I never live under the circumstances, whatever. You, you walk out that door and the circumstances hit you. Okay, that's just what happens. And my needs emerge out of circumstances in relationship, at work. Perhaps you have issues going on at the office this week. Perhaps you were laid off. Perhaps you don't know what's coming. There's sickness or disease in your family. There's issues between you and a loved one. There's a husband and wife issue. Through the circumstances of life, needs are exposed. Remember last week we talked about Jack and Jill going up the hill to fetch pails of water. Funny little story. I had a lady come up to me this week. She goes, I got to tell you a story. She goes, my husband and I were at home, and we'd been working all day, and so we were joking about Jack and Jill going up the hill fetching pails of water. And their little girl, who's pre-kindergarten age, it wasn't in the service, but when they started talking about Jack and Jill... Uh, the little girl knew the nursery rhyme. Because a lot of kids don't know these nursery rhymes anymore because they're too busy watching something on television. And so the mother, the wife, looks at the little baby girl and she goes, and who do you think carries more pails of water, Jack or Jill? And the little girl goes, Jill. (laughs) So it's just, it happens at a young age. They already think they're producing more. So anyways, you... So we talked about how Jack and Jill going up the hill fetching pails of water, the circumstances of life emerged through this thing, and we, we told the story of how Jack has his needs of security, identity, and belonging, and he wants us to be met in Jill. Jill has the same thing, wants us to be met in Jack. Here's the dangerous part. In the midst of circumstances, when needs emerge, we oftentimes form expectations. And expectations are dangerous. Agreed? Well, it's true if you don't agree. Expectations are dangerous because my expectations are usually connected to another person or institution that I believe is going to meet my need. Because I remember we talked about I meet every circumstance with a choice of what I see, what I want, and what I think I deserve. I see that. I want it. I think I deserve it. Jill thinks she deserves from Jack certain things. Jack thinks he deserves from Jill certain things. And their kids think they deserve certain things. And these expectations swirl And then we talked about how when those expectations aren't met, I oftentimes start building up things around me of guarding and protecting and defending. Now, let me back up for a minute because let's go back to Jack and Jill. We'll keep it make-believe so we don't have to personally apply it, right? So Jill, when she was five years old, was physically abused. Jack, when he was 10, saw his family break up. And what happens with Jack and Jill, I know it didn't happen to anybody here, so it's our our imaginary person. Jack and Jill were already hurt at the realm of trust. And remember, God works at a soulish level, and so does the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the enemy. And the enemy works soulishly in us as well. Now, neither Jack or Jill deserved to be hurt at 5 and 10 But the enemy was working on their lives, especially in the realm of trust, and here's the reason why. Because the enemy knows that if I trust God, he's got a problem. So what he wants to do is harm relationships around me, especially of trust, so that I project onto God what I've learned about relationships here. So you see, early on in life, the enemy is working on trust issues, and early on in life, I'm being disappointed, and early on in life, I don't get what I think I deserve, but also remember, things happened to you that didn't, they shouldn't have happened to you. You did not deserve for them to happen to you, but regardless of the issue, when real needs, security, identity, belonging, competence, purpose, when those needs are not met the way God intends for them to be met, I start building up walls of guarding and protecting and defending and sheltering. You can't see the wall, but I'm building the wall. And oftentimes, I start building that wall at a very young age or very early in marriage. Now, here's what happens. As soon as I start doing that, one of two things is going to happen. And this is where we pick up with the chart. I begin building an internal structure of defense 
that doesn't have any actions associated with it yet. Okay, so for instance, if someone hurts you at a young age or does something to you, or you, you are, you just hurt in any particular way, oftentimes what we do is we, I'll use this term, we stuff, okay? We just, we, we just put it in and just push it down. Someone hurt you when you were a young child. Someone did something to you in a relationship. I will tell you that for families who, for children who come out of broken homes, this is not guilt towards mom and dad. This is just the reality that there's a lot of issues that take place as far as trust and who, who, can, who, who can I look up to. And you immediately build walls and you start shoving down. And, and if uh, maybe something happened at school, maybe something happened in a relationship on the playground, maybe something happened in a boy, boyfriend or girlfriend relationship, maybe someone told you they loved you and they really didn't. All these things happen. Where I, I trust someone because they said they'd do this for me and they didn't do it. And I just start cramming things down. Okay, the reason I read to you out of Hebrews is because when you start cramming down, that's where the root of bitterness starts working. Okay? And the enemy works at the soulish level where bitterness builds. And here's the lie of the enemy that the scripture reveals. You cannot keep that down there without it coming out sometime. So this was years ago, we had just built this campus and along the back driveway where all this asphalt was, I was actually running one afternoon and literally just caught my attention this, this like cactus that grew out of the asphalt. And I stopped and I was like, that's amazing. I called a friend of mine who was a photographer, I know this is really weird, and I said, could you come take a picture of this weed for me? And, and the photographer came and took a picture and made this beautiful black and white picture of a weed for me. It's in my office. I know people are probably like, I knew you were strange, but you have a picture of a weed. And, and because at that moment, it struck me, oh my goodness, I don't care what you put over it, eventually it will come out. And most of us have been in a situation, whether it's Thanksgiving supper or it's some family event where you have this event where everybody, a few of you get together in the kitchen and go, did that just happen? You ever seen that conversation? Did that really just happen? Did she really just say that? Did he really just say that? Have you ever been in a family gathering and just gone, I, I don't know what's going on here? If you haven't, oh, just wait. I don't know what to say to you. But, but what happens is, but here's also what happens. Remember Jack and Jill going up the hill to fetch a pillow of water? Jack, if... Jill does not meet his expectations over time. He stuffs that down. Now, the first time he went to bed and kissed her and rolled over and said, I guess it was a tough day. The 10th year into it, he begins to believe I deserve better than that and I want better than that and I've seen better than that. And plus the lady at work tells me I look buff because of all the pails I've been carrying. <laughs> and Jill says the same thing. She goes, I deserve better, I want better, I see better. Plus the guy at work says I'm looking pretty svelte. And, and whatever. So it, it just, all this happens, and it's not just happening out of the blue. The enemy works on a long-term basis. And by the way, he started on you as soon as you started understanding there could be a trust issue. And so this just, this just happens, and it goes down inside, and it goes down inside, and it goes down inside. But there's also a circumstance that reveals the needs, that leads to what I see, want, think I deserve, where I start guarding and protecting and defending, and that can happen rapidly. And all of us know what it's like to, to have a situation occur and our response emerge immediately. We're ready within seconds with a word or an action, right? You know exactly what it's like, because listen, I know none of you are guilty, so let's go back to Jack and Jill. So Jack and Jill go up the hill to fetch pails of water. They come home, Jack walks in, Jill says, where have you been? He goes, well, I don't know, where have you been? There's no stuffing. I mean, the gloves are off, we're going to fight. But here's the truth, whether you like it or not. You don't throw the gloves off and start fighting unless you've been stuffing already. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? Are you with me? Okay, don't agree because that means that was you. So here's the deal. Here's what happens. Whatever's internal has to come out, and oftentimes it comes out quicker or sooner rather than later. That's why you have this internal sort of spinning thing right here, and you also have this external piece, okay? Because for instance, I always use this as a stupid example because all of us know what it's like. 
You drive down the loop, somebody cuts in front of you, you honk your horn and go, play, praise the Lord, which is probably not what you did. But for a moment, there was a season of satisfaction by your aggression. You couldn't do anything about it except go home and go, don't you wish you had a car you could just run into people with no consequences? But other than that, you have an action that occurs eventually or immediately, and for a short season, you feel good about yourself. There is a season of satisfaction in that I have put you in your place. For a moment, Jack goes, yes, I'm king, okay? For a moment, Jill goes, yes, I'm queen. But then they go to bed and don't obey the scriptural norm that says don't go to bed on your anger. They wake up, they have stuffed it. It comes back. And so eventually when it comes back, you do it again. Here's the problem. Satisfaction is a fleeting moment. And then you wake up or you turn around and realize, oh, I'm not as satisfied as I thought I was. That's why Galatians says, when you sow to the flesh, you reap death. You sow to the spirit, you reap life. We'll get into the spirit issue next week. But watch this, because there's this little thing that says start over, as it goes to the right there. Here's what's happening for most of us. We keep repeating the same mistake and the same emotional problem. It's not because of a circumstance, it's because of a need that we keep getting met outside of God's plan. And that's why you can go through multiple marriages or multiple best friends or multiple jobs or multiple situations and you never address the real need that God is teaching you, you can trust me. My plan is for your life. And, and some of it is the fact that you still have not gone back and released the hurt that occurred in the past that keeps coming up out of bitterness and poisoning people around you. And you just keep repeating the mistake. And you wake up one day and go, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep doing this? And I don't want us to have a teddy bear moment where we all go back and get our childhood teddy bear and hug it and go, I'm going back to my childhood and crying. That's not the issue. But sometimes we need to stop and pray for a minute and say, you know what, Father God, however you do that, for me it never occurs just bowing my head. It usually occurs on a walk. And... And just saying, hey, Lord, um, I'll tell you what, I'm still pretty ticked off about what happened when I was in fourth grade to our home. And I have harbored bitterness and a lack of trust with that issue, and I can't shake it unless you root it out. Now, you just fill in your story. Hey, God, this person did this to me when I was an eight-year-old girl. And I didn't deserve it. You're right. But the enemy has capitalized on that to tell you you can't trust him and also tell you you can no longer use your sexuality for your joy in your marriage and you're wondering what's happening and you're going to counseling and he's on Viagra trying to figure out what's going wrong. And the reality is, he said, well, isn't there a physical issue? Yeah, but there's a spiritual issue. And the dude might be dead that hurts you, but he's not dead in your soul. And you have to say, God, I got to get rid of this. And only you by the Spirit of God can release this. And you may have this consistent issue of losing jobs because something happened a long time ago at a particular place of work where some guy said, you're the most valuable employee we've ever had. We like you. And the next thing you know, your feet get cut out from under you. And from that point on, you can't shut your mouth at work hurting people because of the bitterness inside of you that you can't trust anybody. And eventually you stuff and you pile and you crush and the weed comes out and a picture is snapped and destruction takes place. It's throughout issues that we don't realize God is working in our real needs, but so is the enemy picking away to try to get us to believe we cannot trust God. And that stuff just keeps going down and keeps going down. And when we talk about repenting, folks, there's nothing I can do for you. I cannot pray it out of you. An elder cannot pray it out of you. You know the weeds and you know the garden in your soul. And at some point, you gotta be willing to stop and say, God, all right, I'm just going to tell you, here it is. And God's not going to go, finally. I mean, he, he, he may say, I'm so glad you're here now. Because what I don't, what he's not going to do is root it around and go, you're a loser. He wants to take that out because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Now, here's, here's what I want you to remember. 
You didn't know this 25 years ago, some of you, or 30 years ago. The issue is not for you to go, oh my goodness, I am a loser. No, 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 no. The issue is to stop and say, I have missed life in some point, and God has kept me alive till today to realize this. Quite literally, for some of you, I'm just going to say this for whatever it's worth. It's going to take a trip to a cemetery to stand there and go, we're done. Do I believe people are there? No. But there are some times when you need to go to a place. You may have to go to a hometown. And you may just have to stand there and go, we're done. We're done. I've done that. And you just have to give God the opportunity to start rooting this stuff out. And next week, when we come back, Jack and Jill's story is going to get better, okay? And, and hopefully for all of us it will, because all we've been dwelling in now is the wisdom from below. Next week, we turn it to the wisdom from above. But remember, repentance is not a lost person word. Repentance is a saved person word to turn around and change my mind and treat this situation differently. And I hope this is the beginning of a process for you. As always, elders will be down here at the front, both in Odessa and in our North Campus. Love to pray with you. But as we begin to close things down and they shut things down there in Odessa and North, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. And let me just pray over you. It's sometimes some pretty heavy stuff. Again, the objective is not to make you feel guilty or beat on, but to hopefully open some new doors for life so that you can get rid of the the weeds that are growing out of the asphalt you've put over this stuff. Father, I thank you for your grace. You tell us in the book of Hebrews not to miss it. So I pray we would not miss it. And I ask for your wisdom for each of us to know how to deal with our situations on this side of the chart and to walk in joy that you have promised us through Jesus and you made evident through the cross and the resurrection. I thank you for life. I thank you that you today woke us up so we could learn more about walking with you. Uh, Give us your grace as we go through this day, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you have a great day and a great week. We'll see you next week, hopefully.